Good morning, or whatever time of day you're watching our service. We welcome you to the Sunday morning, March 29th, 2020, worship service of Bridgewater United Methodist Church. And uh, we are welcoming you in your pajamas, uh, with your cup of coffee, maybe you're eating breakfast. And we are just delighted that you can join us. Maybe it's later in the day or maybe it's a day or two later. We recorded this service earlier in the week and we are just delighted to be able to bring it to you in this way since we are at this time, because of the coronavirus, not allowed to have church or gatherings of people of 10 or more. So thank you for viewing and God bless you.
The scripture lesson for today from the Old Testament is Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. Verse 1, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, to these bones I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinew on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesy as I had been commanded. As I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had came upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and the breath upon their slain, and they may live. I prophesy as he commanded, me and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. From the New Testament, lesson is John 11 1 to 45 now a certain man was ill Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair her brother Lazarus was ill so the sister sent a message to Jesus Lord he whom you love is ill but when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, through Jesus' love, Martha and her sister and Lazarus. After having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The di disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there, no, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk in night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to waken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be only, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them, finally, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad. I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go, there we may die with him. 
When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. (coughs) Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you every, whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again and in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoled her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came with where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved them? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was laying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already this is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of the Lord? So they they took away the stone and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come fo- come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with stripes of strips of cloth and his feet face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews before who had came with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Edward. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you once again for the word that you give to us this day, and we always thank you for that word that brings life to us, gives us hope, encourages us to go forth, and allows us to speak the gospel in truth, and to share the gospel in deed, and to be the people you have called us to be, so that your glory might be revealed in all things. And this we give you thanks for in the name of Jesus. Amen. Three friends were talking about death. 
And one said to the other two, What do you want people to say at your funeral? And the first person said, Well, I'd like for them to say that I was a good humanitarian. I loved my community and cared for my people. The second one said, I would like for people to say, he was a good husband and a great father, a tremendous example for many to follow. And the third person said, I'd like for people to say at my funeral, hey, look, he's moving. <laughs> In the Old Testament reading, Today, we heard the story of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is led to this valley of bones. The scripture says he was led by the Spirit, taken to this valley of bones. And, and if, if you will, picture and imagine with me Ezekiel walking through this valley of dry bones. I don't know about you guys, but that probably would not be one of my favorite things to do, walk through a valley filled with bones. And as he's walking, God asks the question, Mortal, can these bones live? I wonder if Ezekiel had to think about that for a minute. Or if he just said, well, God, I don't know, but you know. You know, kind of putting it back on God. Lack of faith, maybe? I don't know. Ezekiel's been with God for a long time. They've been through a lot of things together. And now God's asking him the question, and he's putting it back on God. God, I don't know, but you know. And God says to Ezekiel, Talk to the bones. Prophesy. Prophesy to the bones. And say to the bones, thus says the Lord God, I will breathe breath into you and you will live. Uh, okay, Ezekiel has just said to God, I don't know, but you know. And now God's saying to Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones and tell them, thus says the Lord God, I will breathe breath into you and you will live. Not only will I breathe breath into you, but I will cause sinew to come upon you. I will cause flesh to come upon you. I will cause skin to come upon you. And then I will breathe life into you. And then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Now, I don't know, but for me, that would take a lot of faith. So as, again, be with me in the valley of bones. And, and we're walking through, and, and we're prophesying to the bones, and they start rattling. That would be the time I would leave the valley of bones. I would be running about as fast as I could run to get away from the valley of bones. God would be hot on my heels because he would know that I didn't have enough faith to prophesy to the bones to believe that God could do what God will do. And I'm running. Because the bones are rattling. They're coming to life. They're coming bone to bone. And Ezekiel is witnessing all of this. And the bones come together and he looks and there's sinew and he looks and there's flesh and he looks and skin has covered them and there they are standing. They're fully clothed in skin and flesh and they're standing and there's a huge multitude. It's not just one or two. It's a whole multitude. But they're not alive. There's still one thing that Ezekiel has to do. They're not alive. Ezekiel, they're not alive. Prophesy to the breath. Call from the four winds the breath that it enters into them and gives them life. Call to the breath, Ezekiel. Now, 
what, what do you think God is, is calling Ezekiel to do? I mean, who is it that gives life? Where does the breath of life come from? Well, we, we find in Genesis the story when God created Adam and, and God created him, made him. There he was, but he was not alive. And then God breathed into him what? The breath of life. Ezekiel, call the breath of life. Call God to come and breathe into these bones the breath of life so that they may live. So that you will know. What? What will we know? That I am God. Ezekiel prophesies. And the great multitude comes to life. God says to Ezekiel, this is the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. My friends, I would suggest to us today that this is also the modern day church. We believe that our bones are dried up. There's nothing left for us to give to the world. There's nothing left for us to prophesy. There's nothing left for us to call the breath of God to give life to this world in which we live. We live in fear and we run at the first sign of danger. This is the whole house of Israel. Say to them, I will open your graves. I will cause life to come back into you. I will breathe life back into you so that you will know. What will we know? That I am God. Do you think, my friends, that maybe today we have forgotten who God is and what God can do and what God does? I will cause my spirit, God says, to come upon you and you will live and you will know that I am God. So let's move now to that New Testament story. In the New Testament story, Jesus is with his disciples, and word comes that his one of his best friends. The scripture makes it a point to tell us that this is one of his friends is sick. Okay. And then word comes that his friend Lazarus has died. And Jesus says his his death is really not a death, he's just asleep. And, And of course you know what creates the conversation then. Well, if he's asleep, his disciples say, if he's asleep, he'll be all right. You know, kind of... Kind of a nice conversation for us to have too, right? You, you know, we start to plan these things. We start to think about these things. Okay, God, if it's this way, then this is what's going to happen. And, and we think in those terms of what we want to see and know and not what God wants us to see and know. And so we put our own self into that. And the disciples are putting themselves, well, if he's asleep, then he's going to be perfectly fine. And then Jesus just, you know, after probably a very long conversation... You know how conversations get about death and life, you know? And, and so there's this probably long conversation, and Jesus finally says, All right, you dummies, he's dead. Dead, dead, dead. He's dead, all right? And then we know, Lazarus is not asleep. He's dead. And, and so then that creates another conversation, right? It's a conversation that they don't speak of. Because they're probably thinking the same thing that Mary and Martha are thinking. Okay, Jesus, they told you he was sick and you didn't go. And then they told you he had died and you wait two more days. Now, Jesus, we thought that you loved him. Notice the scripture also makes it a point to say that Jesus loved Lazarus. And you wait four days? 
Once again, not seeing the whole picture. Not seeing everything that God wants to reveal, but only what we want to see. So Jesus makes his way to the village, and before he gets to the village, Martha meets him. <clears throat> and Martha has that same question that, that I believe the disciples were already asking, and the disciples were probably glad that Martha asked the question, or made the statement, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, they shall never die. Martha, do you believe this? Martha, do you believe this? Ezekiel, do you believe that these dry bones can come to life? Ezekiel, can you believe that breath will come into these dead people? Um, by the way, we, we brought some guests uh, this, this evening too, and I think Scott's showing some of our guests. And, and uh, I am not going to prophesy to the guests. Uh, it, it just kind of makes us you know, look like we're not alone. Even though they can't talk, they can't say a whole lot. Maybe they could be the dry bones, the dead cardboard in our lives. You know, maybe we're the cardboard people walking around that doesn't have any spirit, doesn't have any life, and God's trying to breathe into us the breath of life, and we just won't get it. Martha, do you believe, Ezekiel, do you believe that God can put breath into these dead, dry bones and bring them to life? Martha, do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? And if you believe this, you will not die. Your brother will not die. And, and Martha still doesn't get it because she says, Lord, I know. Martha's a pretty, pretty smart cookie, especially for her day. She, she's pretty sharp. Lord, I know this. I know that in the last day he will rise from the dead. And Jesus says, no, you've got it all wrong. Today, I'm the life, the resurrection. Do you believe this, Martha? Martha's not quite getting it. But she does, she does say, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. I believe that you are the one sent from God. And then she runs to get her sister. Now remember the sister Mary in, in one of the previous encounters with, with Jesus. Um, you know that story where Mary and Martha uh, have invited Jesus and the disciples to their home and Martha's fixing the meal and Mary is at his feet and, and Martha comes to Jesus and says, would you make my sister help me? And, and he says to Martha, she is looking for the better part, and I will not take that away from her. Now, Mary has not come to Jesus yet until Martha comes and says, Jesus is here, and he's calling for you. So Mary gets up quickly, and she runs to Jesus. And all the other people in the room think that she's going to the tomb, so they get up and follow her. And she comes to Jesus, and she gets on her knees before Jesus, and she says to Jesus, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Now wait a minute, Mary, you, you have been at the feet of Jesus, you have heard his teaching, you know all about Jesus. Why are you doubting now? Well, death is a pretty big thing, right? You know, people don't just come back from the dead. And, and Lazarus has died. And, and I'm thinking that Mary and Martha are kind of holding Jesus to a specific point. 
If you had been here, he would not have died. You could have saved him. Can you imagine that if you had the power to save your friend or your loved one or your spouse, you had the power or knew someone who had the power, maybe it was a test for coronavirus and you did not get that test, would you not be just a little bit upset? Maybe a little bit angry. If you had only given them the test, they would have acknowledged they were sick, put in the hospital, given the respirator, and, and still be alive. You'd be a little bit upset. Mary and Martha, Jesus, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. I thought he was your friend. Right after that comes verse 11. Jesus wept. I wonder why Jesus wept. Was it because he had been with Mary and had taught her about who he was and she missed it? Some people thought that it was because Lazarus was his friend. And certainly that could be. That certainly could be. But could it also be that Jesus saw the potential of who we could be if only we would believe? If only Mary and Martha, close friends of Jesus, would have only believed. And so imagine with me, if you will, that, that Jesus is weeping. And he says to himself, just a possibility, he says to himself, okay, I'm going to show them one more time who I am and who sent me. Why? Why did Ezekiel rise the dead bones to life so that all of Israel would know that I am the Lord God? So Jesus makes this audible prayer. Father, I make this prayer loud and clear, not because I, I don't believe you hear me, because I know you hear me all the time, but all of these folks out here, Mary and Martha, and all of these folks, so that they can hear as well. Notice what he said to his disciples when he found out that Lazarus had died. I'm glad I wasn't there. I'm glad I wasn't there because you need to see who sent me and the power of God at work. And he's crying. He's crying. I can't help but think that, that he's crying because of you and me and our lack of faith and believing of what Jesus can do and what Jesus does in our lives. And I can't, it can't help but, but think and imagine that, that he is hurt because... We don't believe. I would be, wouldn't you? I mean, if, if you told people about something that was so important that would give to them life, eternal life, forever, and they turned you away, if you offered them that, that coronavirus test, when, when you're standing there gasping for breath, and you say, no, nah, I think I'll be all right. Just let me hang on for another 24 hours, and then offer it to me again. And, and they don't take it, and, and three hours later they die? Would that not make you a little bit upset? Jesus is weeping. And then with a loud voice, he says, Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. Now, I picture in my mind, <laughs> I picture in my mind Lazarus trying to come out. Because the, the scripture tells us that when Lazarus comes out, he is bound in cloth. His, his feet, his body is wrapped in cloth. So how did Lazarus get, get out of the tomb? And, and it probably wasn't a sidewalk. 
It was probably rocks, so he's probably jumping around trying to get out of the tomb. I mean, picture it. it it's almost comical, but, but yet it is so serious that, that he is bound by death. He is bound by the laws that you and I place upon him. He can't get out. He's stuck. He's trapped. Notice what Jesus says when he, he comes out outside of the tomb. Jesus says, unbind him. He's been bound by what you and I see. He's been bound by death. And I'm saying to you that death has no boundaries with God. Amen. And they unbind him. And Jesus has set him free. You see, that's what Jesus wants for you and me. Ezekiel and the dry bones. It was all for God's people so that they could see that God could set them free. Call them up out of the graves because the graves were binding them. They were saying to themselves, we are trapped, we have no hope, we can't do anything. God, help us. Does that sound familiar for us today? God, we are trapped, we are bound. We're bound by all of these things in our world that, that are causing us to fear. Causing us to be bound and trapped. And God wants to set us free. Lazarus, come out. Notice what happens when Lazarus comes out and he's unbound and set free. <clears throat> Those last verses of the Scripture. Many, many Jews, not, not just a few, many Jews came to believe Because of what Jesus did. <clears throat> so a few years ago, we were traveling uh, to see our son in London. And um, our son warned us, uh, do not go on the subway, it's called the tube, do not go on the tube early in the morning, rush hour, late in the afternoon, rush hour. So we had been out that afternoon on our own without our son to kind of guide us. It's kind of like being out in the world without Jesus to guide you. you know, you're just kind of lost out there. And so we're, we're out there and, and guess what? We find ourselves in the tube in rush hour. And if you've never done that, it's quite an experience. Um, you could probably go to a YouTube and find one of those experiences. But it is so crowded. Typically, they have like um, three, three avenues in and three avenues out. But in rush time, they have four avenues out and one avenue in. And so we're, we're down like, like two or three floors down in the tube, and we want to get out. <laughs> and, and, and these huge crowds of people are moving. And, and I'm looking for the exit sign. You know, the exit sign, what does it tell you? It tells you how to get out. Because you've got different places that take you, because if you go this way, you just go to another train, or another tube. You go this way, you go to another tube. You have to make your way up, because you're down in the tube. And I'm looking for the exit sign, and there's no exit sign. But there is a big sign on the wall. And, and the sign says, way out. It doesn't say exit. It says way out. If you follow the sign that says way out, guess what? Not to mention the crowds of people who are going that way, and in many different directions as well, but if you follow the sign that says way out, because everywhere there's a door or an exit, there's a sign that says way out. We followed the sign. And guess what? We got out. I thought about that in preparing today's message. And Jesus is the way out. If we follow Jesus, if we follow God, God will show us 
the way out. Always has. You can use exit, you can use what, whatever word that will help you to follow Jesus, but Jesus is that way out. If we would follow Jesus. He's the way out of the tomb. He's the way out of death. When they went to the tomb on Easter, guess what? We, we know that story. Ezekiel and the dry bones. The way out of death. Israel and the, and the message to Israel. I will open your graves and let you out. Lazarus. What did Jesus say to Lazarus? Lazarus, come out. Come out of there, Lazarus. Come out because I want to set you free. You know, the <clears throat> coronavirus has not hit us yet. <clears throat> but it has for many people. And we don't think much about it right now. And I think <clears throat> the reason we don't think much about it is because it hasn't gotten close. It hasn't taken the life of a husband or a wife or a child or a close friend. But it has in many other places in our country and in our world, thousands even. And there is this great possibility, huge possibility, that it will right here in our community. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to wait until that happens. I don't want to wait until somebody dies and it makes it personal for me because for me, as a person of God, it's already personal. And the reason it's personal is because I care about God's people. I care about that person out there who I don't even know because they know somebody else who knows somebody else who knows me. And we are connected. We may not be in worship together this morning, but we are connected because we are all God's people and God loves every one of us and wants to set us free. He wants to set us free from this virus. He wants to set us free from the virus of death. He wants to set us free from eternal damnation. He wants us to live forever. That's what God's calling us to do. We say that we are dry bones. And there's really nothing we can do. You know? There's really nothing that, that we can do. We just have to shelter in place. <laughs> I don't know about you, friends. But this shelter in, in place has been pretty awesome for me. Of course, I, I really haven't really been quarantined. I've been in the office almost every day. But, but it's been, you know, I, I'm looking at the sheltering thing, not in the sense of you go to your home and you stay in your room forever. I, I'm looking at it in the sense of we're sheltering a way to protect people. We are providing the gospel of the good news in a way that shelters people, protects them, and sets them free. I, I've had more folks uh, come by the office in the past two weeks than I've had probably in six months. Um, we, we are practicing distance. I, I let them come in the office, but then that's about as close as they get. And we keep the, the six, and, and then um, a few minutes later, Edward comes around with his Clorox wipes, and he's taking care of those things. But I found that, that, that this sheltering has, has been a great revealing, if you will. A great blessing. Because you see, I'm more attentive to people. I'm more attentive to those who walk through the door. I'm more attentive to the people at Walmart and Food Lion. I'm more attentive to the people in New York and Louisiana and Washington, and California. Even to those ones who will not listen. Even to those ones who flock to the beach. Even to the ones who flock to Mardi Gras. You know, because that's who we are. We're those not so perfect people. Mary and Martha, maybe. Maybe even Ezekiel. God, I don't know if they can live, but, but you know. 
Mary and Martha, do you believe? Do you believe that I am the resurrection, Jesus says? You know, we're, we're, we're like that. But when we open our eyes and see what Jesus offers, He provides the way out because He loves us. No, it wasn't that He didn't love Lazarus. It wasn't that Lazarus was not his friend. Lazarus was indeed his friend. All the more reason he said to his disciples, I'm glad I'm not there. All the more reason he made that prayer to God. God, I I pray to you so that these people can hear. It wasn't that he was not Lazarus' friend. He was, and he's your friend and my friend, and he prepares that way out. Sarah was two years old, and she had received her first pet. Well, they were pets. They were four goldfish. And she was visiting with Grandma and Grandpa. One of the goldfish died. So Mom and Dad took the goldfish out and flushed it. Goldfish gone. They had to do a little bit of explaining to Sarah. But two days later, Sarah went to the fish tank, and she looked in, and there in that artificial grass was another goldfish had died. So Sarah's talking to her dad, who's at work, and she's explaining to her dad how she and mom are going to the backyard to have a funeral for her fish. And she's crying as she's telling her father on the phone about this experience of going and having this funeral for her fish. And she says to her daddy, 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 please, please, Daddy, never let me get caught in the bushes. Isn't that what the gospel is all about? Jesus Never let me get caught in the bushes. And Jesus is always trying to lead us away from those traps. He's always calling us out to set us free, to give us life, so that we will know that He is the Son of God. So that you and I can make sure that no one else gets caught in the bushes. That's how much Jesus loves us. I pray that in these days to come, that we will offer life to those all around us. That we will be more attentive to the world in which we live. And we will offer to them something that the world cannot give. Jesus. And if we can offer that in these days, we truly will be the people of God. In the name of Jesus, amen.
So that most recent uh, music there was the offertory and the doxology that we would normally sing after the offering had been collected. So there are ways that you can give to support your church, whether your church is Bridgewater United Methodist Church or you attend somewhere else. I'm sure that wherever you go probably has an avenue for you to give. If nothing else, mail a check in. But at our church, at Bridgewater United Methodist Church, you have several options that you can use to provide financial support to the church whose ministry and costs in some ways continue on even in this time of sheltering in place. You can certainly still give in person. There's an offering plate available in the church office during office hours. That's Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You can donate by mail, as I just mentioned. You can mail a check to Bridgewater United Methodist Church, 219 North Main Street, Bridgewater, Virginia, 22812. You can give online through the Bridgewater United Methodist webpage, which is bridgewaterumc.com. And you can donate using your smartphone. I have a smartphone here. There's an app for giving called Give with a plus sign, Give Plus by Vanco. Download, download the app, find Bridgewater United Methodist Church, and give. We encourage you to do that, and we thank you. And we are just delighted that you can be with us today. I uh, came up with some joys. We need to look for ways to have joy in this time of dealing with COVID-19 and life being much different than normal. One thing is that the college students are home. And that has to give a sense of relief to those who were concerned about them. And in Virginia, all the public school children are home. In many states, they are home. They're learning how to use tablets and computers to complete their studies for the school year. It is my understanding that seniors will be allowed to graduate if they're in good standing and were, were expected to graduate anyway. I know that's true in the public schools, the high school. I'm not sure about if colleges have that same uh, standard, but we hope that there's something they can work out. And we also give thanks that uh, Joanne Simpkins' brother, Francis Pfeiffer, uh, is doing much better handling the stress of the COVID-19 outbreak in uh, where he lives. Some concerns we have is uh, for those on the front lines of this battle to control and defeat COVID-19. People such as doctors, nurses, hospital and nursing home staffs plus all the people who have to be out in the public, fire, police, rescue, EMTs, custodians, grocery store and gas station clerks and employees, and even others, those working to restore power when it goes out in many other situations. We lift up to the Lord, uh, Shane Potts, who has pancreatic cancer. We also lift up uh, Joanne Simpkins, uh, another brother of hers, John Pfeiffer, who's in Florida. And we give thanks to God that while he's uh, very, very ill with Parkinson's disease and other complications, his church there is going to, the members of his church there will be lighting a candle every evening and praying for him. Much comfort that gives to his family. Please be in prayer for Joe Brown, Sam Teeter's father a stepdad with fever shortness of breath and coughing continue praying for our nancy bryant and for her doctors at the wound clinic as they treat her for all the people who feel isolated during this shutdown for all those laid off or those who have lost their jobs because of the coronavirus we also lift up to you tiffany bennett smith mike bennett's daughter who has some new health concerns I'm sure you have other prayers that you wish to lift up too. So we'll go to the Lord in a moment of silent prayer, and then I will finish our prayer. Dear loving God, 
Thank you for hearing our prayers. You always hear our prayers. Thank you for being concerned about everything that concerns us. Remind us constantly, Lord, that you are here and you are involved and you ask us to trust in you. So, Lord, we pray that you would give our leaders wisdom, discernment, and strength. Keep them healthy, safe, and rested so that they can guide us through this time. Give our government leaders wisdom on how to stop the virus and stabilize our economy. Give our spiritual leaders your discernment on how to meet people's needs as they glorify your name and encourage the church. Give our medical leaders insight into how to stop the virus, strengthen their resolve, and honor their hard work in creating a treatment for COVID-19. Give our civic leaders inspiration, courage, joy, and strength to meet the needs of their communities. And help each of us as leaders in our communities and our families to display courage, hope, generosity, and kindness. There's a great opportunity now for kindness. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. We lift up to you as well, Lord, our own church family, many of whom are in nursing homes, cut off from family members and friends. Some do not have phones so that we can't even get in voice contact with them, but we can send cards and we can encourage them that way. Help them not despair, Lord, and help them know that we remember and are praying for them. Now hear us, Lord, as we pray the prayer you taught your followers. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you have prayer concerns that you would like to submit to the list, you may contact the church office through uh, Paul McFarland. And you may also contact me or Stephen Creech through email. We'll be glad to add names. And if you have other concerns, let us know those as well. God bless you, and thank you for being with us today.
Thank you, Stephen, for a very powerful and meaningful message, a challenge. I felt very challenged by it myself. And thank you for that. God moved here today, and we'll be moving in the hearts of those who see this and hear it. Now we ask the Lord's blessing on each of you, no matter where you are or when you're a part of this service. Thank you for being here. Lord has a blessing and a plan for your lives. Seek the Lord in this and all situations. God bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen.